Today, I'm really happy to be with uh, two colleagues, Dr. John Ross Rizzo, an American physician scientist at NYU Langone Medical Center. He's serving as the Director of Innovation and Technology for the Department of Physical Medicine and Rehab at the Rust Institute of Rehabilitation Medicine. And he's got cross appointments in the Department of Neurology, also biomedical and mechanical and aerospace engineering at NYU Kenyon School of Engineering. He's also the Associate Director of Healthcare for the NYU Wireless Lab in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering. So every engineering department at NYU practically. He leads the Visio Motor Integration Laboratory, that's VMIL, where his team focuses on eye-hand coordination as it relates to acquired brain injury and the Reactive Lab, that's the Rehab Engineering Alliance and Center Transforming Low Vision, where his team focuses on what wearables for the sensory deprived and uh, whose research benefits from his own personal experience with vision loss. I'm also with Dr. Chen Feng, associate, assistant professor at NYU Tandon School of Engineering in civil and mechanical engineering. His lab, uh, AI4CE, aims to advance robot vision and machine learning through multidisciplinary use inspired research like this that uh, originates from civil and mechanical engineering domains. And previously, uh, Dr. Feng was also a research scientist in the computer vision group at Mitsubishi Electric Research Labs in Cambridge, focusing on visual SLAM and deep learning for self-driving cars and robotics. Okay, a mouthful, thanks a lot. Today, we are presenting uh, AI-based navigation for accessible cities. Uh, JR, why don't you take it away? Well, thanks so much, John. I really appreciate it. I think I owe you some extra money for that introduction. <laughs> I know we told you all that crazy stuff, but uh, I really appreciate it. And uh, I really want to thank C2 Smart, so um, Khan, Shri, and uh, John for, for making this project a reality. And then most importantly, um, uh, Chen Feng, uh, my close collaborator and friend on this project. It's been a lot of fun over the last one year. And, you know, really, this is just the tip of the iceberg. So without further ado, uh, we're going to bounce back and forth between some content here. Um, and uh, I think we're supposed to use the Q&A um, uh, um, uh, feature uh, in Zoom. So feel free to drop some questions and we'll try our best to answer them at the very end. So just in terms of housekeeping, there are some relevant uh, conflictual interests uh, regarding some patents that NYU does hold on the wearable technologies. Um, and there uh, is grant support for these projects, uh, federal, state, municipal, and um, uh, currently uh, do serve on some scientific advisory boards uh, and discussions uh, do uh, typically involve um, uh, related materials. Okay, next slide, please. All right, thanks so much. Um, so uh, if we just hold off on playing the video for one second, if you don't mind, uh, thanks so much. So the over, overwhelming majority of us uh, in this seminar right now have the luxury of an intact visual system and sound visual perception. But what if I flipped the switch and the lights went out and vision was distorted? Here I have uh, three different virtual reality demonstrations um, showing three of the most common vision killers in the United States, age-related macular degeneration, diabetic retinopathy, and glaucoma. And what I'm going to show you is I'm going to show you moderate to severe manifestations of e each of these conditions during a treasure hunt task. So I'll play the demonstrations now slowly, and you'll see on the bottom um, of each of these videos uh, the relevant pathology. So here we have ARMD with central vision loss trying to leverage eccentric viewing. Here we have diabetic retinopathy with scotomas throughout the peripheral field. And then lastly, we have glaucoma with severely restricted peripheral field um, uh, going into uh, tunnel vision um, and just really leveraging that, that small, small central dot in the very, very center. Um, so maximizing use of uh, your macula. Um, so you can imagine how alarming this would be uh, um, uh, for those with these conditions um, and perhaps, um, you know, take a few moments to consider yourself looking through the perception with these masks or filters in place. Next slide, please. So many of us know this is a big problem, but I would argue it's a massive problem. Right now, 27 million American adults age 18 and older report vision loss. And the, the real problem that we're focusing on is that impaired vision constrains mobility. And this immobility leads to all sorts of functional dependencies. And that then leads to, unfortunately, an abysmal uh, employment rate. 
Um, typically, it's the 80-20 split with only 20% being gainfully employed if you're moderately or severely visually impaired. And that unfortunately relates to severe quality of life losses. And so if we look at the charts on the right from, uh, from NEI, the National Eye Institute and, uh, uh, at, the, um, at the NIH, you can actually see that as we age uh, per decade in life for males and females, these vision pathologies skyrocket. And this is a big, big problem. And we all know that the baby boomers are coming of age and we can see the relevant trends. And as we go from uh, about 2020, um, which you can see the bullet on the arrow in the upper right-hand corner, and we target 2050, many of these conditions uh, are set to double, if not quadruple. And we're gonna have over 50 million uh, across the board um, uh, with these vision pathologies. Next slide, please. So what do we do? What is the current standard of care in terms of mobility solutions? Well, you've probably all seen uh, those with vision loss and those who are legally blind uh, swinging a white cane or the Hoover cane or the long cane on the street. This was a technology that was actually invented in 1921 by a photographer who was blinded following an accident named James Biggs. And you can see that visualized in the upper right hand photo here. Um, these white canes are swung in a reciprocating fashion with gait to clear the space that you're about to walk into. Um, now, it's not bad, but unfortunately, it does take a toll and it leaves you vulnerable in many ways. So some prefer to use the guide dog, as you can see visualized in the middle, or on the right, you can see a young child using what's called an adaptive mobility device, which are these kind of um, rectangular frames, which are very simple to use. It's used often as what I refer to as a push and clear strategy. You push it forward. If you hit anything, you stop and you move over and you try again. Um, if you know, if you're, you're, you're moving forward and you don't hit anything, you've now cleared space and you could continue on your intended path. And on the lower images, you can see different adaptations for these adaptive mobility devices. And believe it or not, these are really still all the primary mobility solutions um, uh, for the visually impaired um, to this day. Next slide, please. But what happens if you use these primary mobility devices? Well, unfortunately, we know that obesity still creeps up and is about one and a half times uh, increased risk if you have moderate and severe visual impairment. And we like to think that you fall down this slippery slope of immobility. So it's not just obesity, but you end up having a twofold increased risk of stroke. You have a two to threefold increased risk of type 2 diabetes. You have a threefold increased risk of falls. And if you have problems in depth perception or what's called stereopsis, you actually have a fourfold increased risk in falls. And that oftentimes coincides with hip fractures. So hip fractures are in fact, you have a fourfold increased risk of hip fractures. And then clinical depression as diagnosed by a psychiatrist is three times higher. And then most tragically, if you go to the developing world, those who are poor and blind oftentimes as compared to those who are just poor, lose a decade and a half to do two decades of their life expectancy. So they're dying 15 to 20 years prematurely, which is just tragic. Next slide. So what do we do? How do we support navigation with these white canes? And how do we support things like shopping um, with these white cane solutions? How do we come up with adjuvant technologies or supplemental devices or what are known as secondary solutions to help you know, step it up and see if we could do more to augment the existing approaches? Next slide, please. So for a number of years, um, our group in partnership with a lot of fantastic engineering groups have been working on what we consider sensory augmentative tools or SATs. And here you could see what we call a visually impaired smart service system for spatial intelligence and onboard navigation or vision to the fourth. And on the left-hand side, you can see a fully functioning prototype that we use for field research and one of our interns wearing one while actually conducting some research um, and, and, and the various components labeled. And perhaps uh, for, easy, for easier illustration on the right-hand side, you could see a CAD file um, that demonstrates uh, the four components um, that we consider essential uh, for our, our vision to the fourth uh, platform, which includes uh, on the upper right-hand side, a binaural bone conduction headset. Uh, we tend to use uh, one from a company called Aftershocks, which we can take questions on later. Um, uh, the different sensor systems themselves for sensor fusion. The foundation of our platform is often uh, stereo cameras. We use a platform from Stereo Labs and both Z and Z Minis, which we can again talk uh, more about later. Um, and then the cell phone as a gateway for the embedded system. And then lastly, we use haptic interfaces or feedback belts for touch communication. Next slide, please. 
So our overall goal is human in a loop localization and navigation system in complex urban environments. But what we're trying to do is think about this from an infrastructure free uh, um, standpoint. So really divorce ourselves from any of the infrastructure you would need. And uh, Chen is gonna talk more about this shortly. So again, think about these devices as simply instrumented book bags or backpacks that contain these camera systems and sensors and unique scaffolds and portable microcomputers or embedded systems that are dropped right into the knapsack itself. And then all of the queuing and prompting brought to you through audio and touch feedback, primarily through that binaural bone conduction headset and through that waist strap, or in certain cases, depending on the experiment, uh, the wristband itself. And here on the bottom, you can see, again, um, just to make this clear, the device on the left, the system design in the middle, and on the right, a, a special version of this mapping uh, of this book bag that we use for mapping purposes. Okay, so now I'll hand it over to Chen for some slides, and then I'll come back to you towards the end. Thanks so much. Thank you, JR, um, and thanks a lot for the intro uh, by John. So um, I think JR gives, gives a really good uh, introduction about that motivates the research. Uh, why we want to do this. And also he gave a uh, quite good um, uh, description of the uh, hardware system that, or the interface that uh, we're using to provide the navigation services and instruction services to the um, uh, target populations. Um, in the back end, what enables the interface to provide navigation instructions is something we call it as image-based mapping and localization. So in this slide, I'm just giving you a um, high-level overview of the whole system's pipeline. Um, it contains two stages. The first stage is the mapping stage. This has to be done before the deployment of the system, where we um, use uh, the camera sensors, uh, a mobile camera sensors, to uh, collect a large number of images or video streams in the target area that we want to provide the navigation service. And then later on, the uh, image data would be processed offline. It could be uh, on the cloud service um, to create a 3D reconstruction or um, a so-called topometric map of the environment um, that describes both the position and orientation of the camera in the six, uh, six DOF, uh, six degrees of freedom space, as well as a sparse uh, 3D reconstruction of the uh, certain obstacles um, in the environment. Okay, so that corresponds to the uh, top row of this uh, overview figure. Of course, during this process, we can um, uh, rely on additional sensors such as GPS signal, which is often available with our uh, smartphones or a lot of uh, um, uh, the action cameras that we use to collect the data. After this process uh, is done, we can deploy the system uh, to localize the users. And that process um, is the user will take a photo um, by his or her smartphone or a wearable action camera or the sensors on the book bag that uh, John uh, JR just mentioned. And then the system will uh, send this image through a set of uh, complicated uh, analysis, image analysis or AI-based uh, computer vision uh, machine learning analysis of the image to try to figure out uh, where this image is, okay? Um, and here the on the right-hand side, we're showing the uh, reconstruction of the map for uh, several examples, both outdoors and indoors. Uh, one we did at um, a uh, Brooklyn, the other one was the United Nations headquarters recently. Okay. Um, and over, after we deploy the system, we hope the user uh, to uh, use the system in this example scenario where the user would uh, select the destination and the system will first uh, localize, try to localize where the user is and then uh, search for the plan for the trajectory um, and, and then give all the instructions either through audio or the haptic feedbacks that JR mentioned. Um, um, and, um, and here is just a example scenario, okay? 
Um, one more thing, uh, important thing is the map may be changing, right? The environment that you're seeing today uh, would be different uh, than in a year. So the system should also uh, allow the map to be updated. Luckily, with our uh, framework, um, each time when a user um, um, sends the image to the uh, cloud service to try to localize, that image itself can be used as a information, the, up, the, the newest information to update the map. Uh, we have conducted several um, uh, early demos, either uh, both indoor and outdoor. Um, in the indoor case, it's actually done by one of our uh, robotics master students um, who actually built a uh, assistive robot that can help uh, this lady with visual impairment uh, to uh, navigate and find the, um, uh, the foods in the target uh, store. All right, so uh, before we uh, talk about, so today's talk is mainly we want to share with you our recent findings uh, about the key technology behind the system, which is called visual place recognition that facilitates both the map building and more importantly, the localization stage. Uh, to make sure everybody is on the same page, I prepared these slides to uh, give you a quick overview of what VPR or visual place recognition is. So VPR is basically image retrieval plus geometric verification. Uh, image retrieval is pretty easy to understand. If you ever use the Google image search, you wanna search for some product based on the image that you have or you, you saw somebody's shoes uh, and you, re you really like that, you take a photo of that, send it to the Google image search. The search engine will return the most similar image um, of that, um, um, of the query image that you uploaded, right? So this will help you to understand, oh, that person is wearing um, the shoes of this brand and I can buy it somewhere. So it is really, we're using the image retrieval technolo uh, technology uh, that have been um, uh, for a while and added with the computer vision techniques such as geometric verification to uh, localize where uh, the image is. And there are several types of algorithms that would enable this. This includes a uh, bag of visual words, uh, VLAD or vector of locally aggregated descriptors, or more recently using deep neural networks such as uh, uh, NetVLAD um, that was based on uh, the convolutional neural network. So the over, no matter which algorithm, the overall pipeline is the same and, and we're, we're depicting, uh, uh, illustrating that process for you here. So basically, once you collected a, a large image data set, you try to uh, detect some interest point uh, in each and one of those image, we call those as features. After we detect the features, we try to cluster them in this high dimensional feature space. Typically, people use something like SIFT or SERF, which gives you a 128 dimensional feature space. And then you just run some clustering algorithms such as k-means to, to cut this high dimensional space into uh, different regions. We call this as the uh, uh, latent space vectorization or quantization, okay? Uh, the quantized space is termed as visual vocabulary. So try to make an analogy between this search process versus how you would search for a similar article from Google search engine. So that's why we have all these similar uh, uh, terminologies. So these process will be done before you deploy the system. Okay, once we collected the, the, the map image, we run it through this process, we build the vocabulary, and then we're ready to uh, start the query. When the user send an image, we first detect the feature points, and then we use the visual vocabulary to describe the image into a fixed dimensional uh, latent code, uh, which we call it as image level descriptor. And using this image level descriptor, you can go back to the previous uh, image database um, to perform a fast the nearest neighbor search, okay? Um, and once you find the nearest image and that image 
uh, and after it passed the so-called geometric verification, which basically examining whether the returned image is really correct. Um, and then you localize yourself because the returned image is already geo-tagged, okay? Um, so this is the overall pipeline of the visual place recognition, but there are several challenges uh, for us to deploy it um, in reality to enable more accessible urban environment. The uh, most well-known challenges um, includes how can you build such a large scale geotagged image database um, and you have to do this uh, at a long period, right? The, I, I just mentioned um, the environment might change and you have to do this continuously. Um, even with the existing uh, solutions such as using GPS tagged uh, action cameras or utilizing Google Street View that have already built such a database for you, or we can use technologies such as Visual Slam, um, which enables Google self-driving self car to localize the car and reconstructs a 3D environment. Even with all these technologies and you can build such a database, there are still challenges in the localization phase, which is the robustness of the VPR algorithms. Uh, the cha the the, these challenges can be grouped in, uh, um, into the following two um, categories. First is the image appearance might change. Uh, you might have seasonal change, such as uh, showing in this uh, image. Uh, so the top image was captured in the summer and uh, or the fall, and the bottom row is captured in the winter. And you, as you can see, the visual appearance already changed. The 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 um, uh, the green uh, the amount of green is definitely reduced. Um, also, the depends on the image capturing time. This would add additional challenges. Maybe the, the database image was captured in the morning and the query image was taken um, in the afternoon. So that would cause changes in the image space, okay? You also have environment change. For example, again here, the image was, the first image was taken um, um, in the, actually in the fall. And uh, two months later, uh, the environment actually changed. This, uh, uh, the advertisement got changed, right? Um, the second challenge is the image occlusions. In the environment, you see a lot of uh, um, dynamic objects like our vehicles, pedestrians. This is especially true in the crowded areas such as New York and why uh, the New York City um, areas, okay? So these challenges are already known to the community and people um, studying the VPR algorithms have to try all kinds of methods to improve the algorithm's uh, accuracy. Next, I'm going to talk about several um, challenges that was not um, uh, paying attention, uh, uh, people was not paying attention to these challenges, but they are quite important for our um, uh, application, especially providing this kind of service for the uh, uh, people with visual impairment. So the first thing is viewing direction. When you collect the uh, image, uh, collect this image database, you need to decide the viewing angle of the camera because normally we only have, we're only using this uh, uh, limited field of view uh, perspective cameras that doesn't give you 360 view, okay? So then you need to decide, should I point my camera uh, forward or to the side view, okay? And here I'm showing two different uh, uh, options. If you turn it uh, point uh, uh, toward um, forward uh, along the street direction versus turning it 90 degrees and face the, uh, the buildings, that gives you very different uh, uh, visual appearance even at the same location, okay? So previously the front view or the forward looking view um, was very popular for self-driving cars because people just need to mount it, put a dash mount camera and they can easily collect data. 99% of the, of the data was collected in this way as you will see in, in a minute. Uh, the issue about this kind of data collection is more than half of the pixel 
um, on this image are focusing on the road or the sky. And also the object, especially the object of uh, interest, uh, like the street, uh, the buildings, um, they are far away from the actual location. Okay. Now, of course, uh, you can, what's more interesting for um, uh, our application to provide service to pedestrians is the side view direction, right? Because the side view provides you the frontal parallel images um, of the buildings along the street so that you can identify critical information such as the door plate, the name of the store that you want to go, whether there are an object of interest near you uh, uh, at nearby position. Um, this, is, this is more important. Now, the question unanswered in the community, in the research community, is which of these directions are more challenging for the VPR algorithms? Nobody knows this answer. Okay. Even before we started this research, we have no idea. Um, and if, um, if there is a lot of difference between these two directions, how much would that be and why would that be? Okay. So this is the question that uh, we're asking. And I'm um, uh, not sure whether I can do a poll right now, but I would encourage you to, to write down your thoughts, like whether you think the front view is easier or the side view is easier. Okay. In a few couple of slides, I'm going to reveal the answer and describe which one is more challenging and why. Okay. The next challenge uh, was also um, was not uh, uh, discussed uh, uh, before, but it, it attracts more attention recently is the privacy concern. As we mentioned, uh, to make the VPR work in metropolitan areas, you need to collect a large number of images across a long time. So these brings definitely privacy concerns, right? Uh, People may, may worry that like their identity information may be revealed uh, in these data sets. And what's worse, if their, their daily action trajectories might be um, uh, uh, detected uh, from this kind of data set, right? So uh, a simple way to address these concerns is to use the so-called data anonymization, where we can simply wipe out all the identity-related pixels and turn it into a, uh, the white pixel. So in this way, only the shape, the, the silhouette of the person or the vehicles is revealed. Nobody knows who they are. Privacy concern is addressed. However, the question left unanswered in the community is, would this significantly affect the performance of the existing VPR, right? What if, if I remove those pixels, would my performance drop or would it increase? On the other hand, may, people may think, oh, the dynamic uh, object like vehicles or, or pedestrians is not really useful for localizing. Maybe after doing this, the performance would even increase. So no one knows this answer until we start to investigate into these problems. So. Our investigation starts from the effort of the uh, uh, data set uh, that uh, we obtained. Uh, it was taken around the NYU Washington Square campus, um, and the area um, is about two kilometer by two kilometers. Okay? Uh, the data set contains both front view and side view images, um, and we process the image uh, so that we uh, have both the raw image and the anonymized image um, as shown in the uh, uh, right-hand side, okay? Um, here also shows the characteristics of this data set. Uh, it is taken for a whole, um, for a whole year and uh, um, in each and every month and also the, it's almost 20, 24 seven, okay? Um, here we're showing uh, the uh, uh, data at four different locations um, at uh, the, the four seasons, okay? So each row is one location and, uh, uh, sorry, each row is one location and each column represents one season. As you can see, the seasonal changes uh, clearly with some appearance change due to construction as well. So this data set is very challenging for uh, visual place recognition and it's a really large scale. 
Some of the challenges we summarize here, for example, the, um, uh, uh, the appearance change due to construction here, right? Um, as well as the seasonal changes. These two images, hard to, to, to believe that they are taken at the same location, but they are according to the GPS tag. As you can see, these geo, the, the visual appearance is very, very different, right? Also, we have some additional challenges, including the motion blur in the data set, right? Some, some images does not have motion blur because the, the vehicle may be moving in with a slow speed, that sometimes when it's driving faster, you would suffer from this motion blur. So what is the difference between this data set versus existing data set? Well, basically, exist, none of the existing uh, image uh, data sets uh, on the related topic um, is none of them are enough to support our investigation to answer the previous questions. Here, the table shows a comparison um, of uh, several data sets uh, that was uh, released over the past uh, 10 years. Some was done by Google, some was done by in the Europe, in Tokyo, uh, so on and so forth. As you can see, if you consider the side view, the dynamic objects, whether it's captured in a crowded area, whether they consider data anonymization, whether they include seasonal changes, and also the number of images. Um, this shows the uh, usefulness of uh, the data set that we, are, uh, uh, we collected uh, through this research. So um, here I'm showing uh, our findings after benchmarking all the different uh, uh, VPR, state-of-the-art or classic VPR algorithms, um, and we're showing the result here. Each, we have four colors. Each color represents a different um, VPR algorithms. NetVLAD is the state-of-the-art neural network-based methods. VLAD is the uh, method that, a classic method before deep neural network, um, and uh, all the way to bag of wars, okay? Um, and here, the line style represents the uh, benchmarking result on the side view images versus the front view images. As you can see, there is a clear difference if you compare the curves between of the same color, okay? Now, the, this goes to, it's time for me to reveal the answer, which one is easier according uh, to the, um, uh, the question that I just asked. So not sure if you guessed it correctly, but this result turns out to be very surprising for uh, uh, many experts working in this area in VPR, uh, in VPR because they thought, well, front view actually contains less localizing cues than the side view because side view gives you better view of the street, of the buildings. Um, why is that? Why is front view consistently uh, getting better performance compared to the side view images? Okay, so save your, uh, your start guessing why, and uh, we will reveal the answer in a minute. Um, here is another uh, result that shows the difference between the raw, the, the benchmarking result on the raw image versus the anonymized image. Um, as the result clearly shows that there is some influence, but they are minor, almost negligible. Uh, if we have more data, you can imagine the, the performance would, uh, the difference would, the gap would be even smaller. Um, and some, some, in some cases, the uh, anonymized uh, performance actually is better than the raw images, okay? All right, the similar result, you can see it um, on the top five accuracy plot. So previous two graph, I'm showing so here, probably I should explain how to read this graph. The X axis means a threshold that we use to determine whether the retrieved image is correct or not. Okay, you use the distance threshold based on the GPS tag. The Y axis shows the uh, accuracy. So whether you can consider the top one retrieval results or you're considering all the top five images returned by the VPR algorithm. Um, so either consider top five or top one, the uh, tendency um, of the, the observation we had before still holds, okay? So this brings us to the question, the first question, 
why is the side view more challenging for VPR algorithms? So we have several hypotheses. The first hypothesis, the, the first one is the because of the way that the side view images are collected on this vehicle and uh, neighboring side view images have uh, uh, smaller overlaps as shown here. Okay, if because the uh, camera cannot uh, capture the image with a large frame rate that would increase drastically the data data size. So there is a, a, a gap between the two sampling locations. With such a gap, you can see the overlap between the neighboring images on side view is much smaller compared to the forward facing or the front view images because uh, basically the previous image sees almost completely uh, the uh, the field of view of the next image. Okay. Uh, the second uh, reason is the side view uh, also covers less spatial areas. Uh, if you consider these shaded areas represents the street side buildings, uh, they're very close to the vehicle. Unlike the forward facing the front view camera, uh, they can see uh, a lot larger areas. These are all important to provide visual features uh, to localize the camera. Now, this is not enough. We still have one more, uh, like two more reasons. First is side view images suffers more from motion blur. Uh, this can be seen from this uh, image. We are basically running a motion blur detector over the images. Uh, the side view um, have almost 50% uh, of the image suffer from certain degree of blurriness in the image, whereas the front view uh, has less, suffers less from that. The reason is, again, because the distance from the camera to the object is uh, uh, shorter for the side view compared to the front view, okay? Um, and uh, why blurriness affects? Well, you can see it from this plot. If uh, the color represents the, uh, either whether it's a, uh, the result on the side views blurry image or side views non blurry image uh, compared to the front view blurry or front, front view non blurry. Uh, first observation is the blurry, uh, both the blue and the red, are lower than the non blurry ones, right? So this shows the blurriness is definitely making, uh, making it difficult for VPR algorithms to retrieve the correct result. And, um, and then you can compare between the side views and uh, front views. Okay, the last uh, reason, uh, hypothesis is that the side view images are easier to be affected by other vehicles and pedestrians uh, because they're closer to those objects. When you remove those dynamic object, uh, they create a large region of white pixels on the image, which provides no localization cue. Uh, or clue for the uh, VPR algorithms. So you can see it from this analysis that clearly shows that the X axis shows different anonymization rate. Basically it's the percentage of uh, wiped out pixels uh, and Y axis is the uh, success rate um, of the uh, VPR algorithm. So the side view, uh, in, for the side view, the performance decreases as the anonymization rate increase. Whereas for the front view, uh, the uh, more uh, dynamic object that you remove from the image, actually the performance increases, right? So I think these are all very intuitive uh, to understand. Next, I will show some visual results, uh, visualization of the benchmark result. Uh, here, we're basically showing uh, a comparison at the uh, same location, one is uh, the front view, the other is the side view, where this row shows, this column shows the query image, and the, we show three blocks of results uh, from three different algorithms. The three image are the top three retrieved results from the uh, image database. Um, if a uh, return, the result is too far away from the, uh, uh, query, ground truth query location, you can see this, it's crossed out. Um, so from this kind of visualization, you can see how challenging the problem is and um, uh, 
um, you can even you can also compare the performance between different benchmark uh, uh, baseline algorithms. We also showed some of the more detailed comparisons between side view versus front view. They're all taken at this query images are taken at the same location, but um, one, is, uh, one is side view, the other is the front view. Um, and uh, you can see the differences. So this result shows that the side view images are more challenging. Um, and similarly in this result um, and this result, okay? We also show the blurry versus non-blurry image. If you the image have blurriness, the results is definitely uh, much worse uh, for even some of the best performing algorithms. Um, here shows clearly the anonymization uh, challenge. See the vehicles are wiped out, so the whole image is only was fifty, like about fifty percent of the useful pixels. Okay, even though in this case all the algorithms success because the feature is the the background feature is pretty uh, uh, easy to capture. But for a lot more cases, you can imagine when we remove those uh, uh, dynamic objects from the side view, the whole image has not many useful information. Okay. All right. So time to discuss some take home messages uh, from our investigation. First, we show that the VPR uh, is a useful technique uh, that is enabled by AI, which basically means computer vision and machine learning in this case. Um, and this technology can reduce the dependency um, on sensor infrastructure for navigation, unlike GPS or Bluetooth beacons, so on and so forth. Okay, so they're a promising method for making the urban environment more accessible to the visually impaired population. Um, another th important thing is we uh, identified that side view images are more important for the visually impaired population. Uh, through our investigation on the large scale data set, uh, we found that existing methods uh, and the way the data set was collected uh, makes the side view images more challenging uh, than the front view images for VPR. And also we showed that the data anonymization uh, does not create a large difference. So that means in, in the future when people are, or the uh, any um, industry folks wants to use these technology, they should always uh, uh, remove and anonymize the data from the collection stage to avoid any concern. Okay, they can throw away the raw uh, image and only store the anonymized image. Um, and uh, last but not least, we identify the need that better data collection protocols and algorithms are needed for side view VPR. Um, only relying on Google Street View like data collection is clearly not enough. Uh, maybe we can address this issue by using, um, uh, putting cameras on pedestrians or bicyclists uh, so that uh, they are, because they're moving slower um, and uh, they can get a better quality image and they can get a denser um, uh, collection sampling um, of, the, of the results of, of the streets. So the research um, was based on um, uh, two papers. Uh, one was published uh, uh, three years ago in IRIS uh, and another is currently under review. Here we uh, list all the co-authors. Uh, some of them are uh, students at uh, NYU, some of them are my uh, collaborators. Um, and uh, without their uh, uh, significant contribution to this project, it's not possible for me to show all these interesting um, um, conclusions and data uh, uh, interpretations. So the, our ongoing efforts, uh, I think uh, maybe JR can take over to describe our ongoing uh, efforts sure. and future steps. So as the uh, approach has advanced, um, you know, we've uh, been asked to advise with the Office of Information and Communication Technology at United Nation headquarters, which is very exciting um, under the umbrella of accessibility. Um, they've been working on developing some mobile technology 
uh, to help with wayfinding through UN headquarters. Um, so just very briefly, uh, not to spend too much time, but for those who are unfamiliar with UN headquarters on the upper right hand side, you can see a, a very nice aerial shot of uh, UN um, headquarters in New York City. Um, many of us are very familiar with what's actually referred to as a secretariat building, which is this very tall structure that we often see from the east side of Manhattan um, on the very right of that image. And then right in front of that, you can see diplomatic drive or circle uh, where all of the high dignitaries are dropped off, presidents, heads of state, et cetera. Um, and underneath that building and then going back out uh, towards the East River is a large horizontal broad building called the conference building, which is really where the public spends most of their time. And then to the um, immediate left, you can see kind of a larger building that's much smaller and then well lit here on this image. And that's the General Assembly building. So that's actually where they hold uh, the larger meetings with all the heads of state. And that's typically shut off to the public, although they hold tours around that actually General Assembly um, room itself. Um, and that building is open to the public and there's a gift shop in the basement. Um, for any of you who have taken tours, you've probably entered to the left of that um, building itself, um, gone into an open air plaza um, which is right next to the Rose Garden, which overlooks the water. It's very beautiful. And then you have access to um, uh, actually um, the lower side of the conference building and then could ultimately get to the secretariat. Um, so um, we've been working on actually um, uh, creating some uh, reconstructions uh, of UN headquarters, all the public facing areas and working on um, testing uh, the VPR approach um, there and um, here you can actually see uh, the conference rooms again, uh, where they hold a lot of their public events for international days for, for day for persons with disabilities, for example, in these larger conference rooms. Uh, here is the actual 2D floor plan of that room uh, from their office, uh, which you can see visualized here, which we're doing um, uh, for accuracy testing purposes uh, when we actually do create the reconstructions. and. Um, you can actually see some 360 degree uh, camera footage um, on the left hand side of this slide um, of our team walking through United Nation headquarters and then some of the early reconstructions uh, in the point clouds that are being generated of um, these areas in United Nation headquarters. So, you know, the idea here is to come up with uh, some type of a cell phone application uh, where uh, an app can be downloaded ahead of time. Uh, those with different uh, visual disabilities could download this uh, based on some e-blasts. Um, they then come in, are given a lanyard, uh, the phone is faced outward, um, and then with audio prompts, um, uh, they could actually walk through um, the UN and be supported through wayfinding with potentially a VPR backbone, uh, which is very exciting. So um, the, the one thing that I'll just double click on very briefly um, is what we noted here is they're both outdoor and indoor areas, and what's very nice and exciting about this project is um, we intend to use the same approach for the outdoor to indoor handoff, which has been a big problem uh, in accessibility research for a long time. Um, so that's very exciting about this project as well. So um, I know we have about 10 minutes left. So I, I think we just owe many people um, thanks, including uh, Claudio uh, Silva for uh, the data, C2 Smart again, uh, Chen and his team, uh, Khan, thank you for all the support. I thank the School of Medicine team for all the coordination and programmatic support, Mahi and Todd, and um, I think we'll open it up for questions. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Professor Fang and Professor Rizzo, for talking about this cutting edge research. Um, as Professor Rizzo said, feel free to use the Q and A box at the bottom of the screen. We welcome questions. I'd love to read some out loud for the presenters. Um, I will kick things off myself with two sure. questions about uh, this research. So, um, can you maybe talk about? Some of the different considerations when applying the VPR technology indoors, like in the UN headquarters, versus um, the, the, the previous research. So differences between indoor versus outdoor, for example. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. So you know, I mean, obviously the big one. Uh, I mean, I'll let uh, Chen answer as well. But just to start things off, you know, the big, the big difference here is obviously um, uh, the, having GPS, right, and having that signal. Um, outside, obviously, we could adva you know, take advantage of GPS or GNSS, and, and, and that could be very helpful when we're doing what I'd call kind of um, localization priming in terms of figuring out where we are uh, with regards to, um, you know, uh, uh, trying to sweeten the pot 
um, in terms that uh, um, an, an, an initial image retrieval that Chen was referring to earlier on within the kind of the VPR um, history, um, if you will, over the last 10 years or so. Um, you know, that, GP, that GPS priming, if you will, I'll use that terminology, can be very helpful. Once you go inside, um, that could be less useful, but there are other things that you can use. Um, so, you know, you can use either, and we, we'd like to think of this technology as um, uh, trying to stay infrastructure free, but I, I'd rather like to think of it as infrastructure light. So we could certainly take advantage of some infrastructure. So if there happen to be some beacons or um, uh, there is some infrastructural um, uh, elements that are installed, whether it's RFID or Bluetooth, that could be very helpful um, as an initial gateway um, uh, into the system. Um, but what's nice about this, if we, if we have stronger pre-mapping data, which we do have here, and, and all of the, uh, the public facing areas have been mapped, we're now talking about actually mapping some of the private spaces that are used by the officials and diplomats. Um, we then are able to, able to use that, and there are other things we can do to help um, um, you know, confirm uh, where we are in space. But I'll, I'll turn it over to Chen. I'll just start, start that off uh, as an initial answer. Thanks, uh, uh, JR, for the for the uh, answer. I think uh, something I can add is um, uh, the first the big difference is the data collection, the mapping part, uh, because for indoor case, we don't have GPS anymore. Um, unlike the large scale data set that we showed outdoors, which is basically you put a GPS receiver on the on the vehicle, then everything is localized. Right. But in the indoor space, this is not possible. Uh, and we have to rely on the visual uh, simultaneous localization and mapping, visual slam, uh, to create the map as shown on these, uh, in these animation. And the second difference is for indoor space, the object camera distance is shorter, uh, which means it's closer to the side view situation, no matter which way you are facing. Um, and especially if you're using a uh, regular perspective camera, the, uh, you may be at a certain moment facing a uh, complete wide wall that provides no localization uh, clues at all, right? So that's why in the indoor case, we're uh, switching, um, at least right now, we're using the uh, 360 action camera uh, to, so that you can, at any moment you get to see the 360 view surround you, that gives you better uh, success rate to localize yourself. Of course, this brings some challenge in terms of what if the person does not have a 360 view camera. So that's the, I would say this is a challenge, but also an opportunity for developing the next phase of the um, algorithm. So uh, to, to address, for example, if I detect um, there is some uh, localization uncertainty because I have no features, maybe I can give a warning to the user say, Maybe I can guide the user to turn the camera to something that can give you better localization, right? That's something we can do. So this is something that um, in the outdoor case, you don't need to think too much about, but you do, once we make progress in the indoor case, they would uh, in return help the outdoor performance. And, and then, you know, one last thing to just close it out is that, you know, the UN is getting progressively excited about this. And so, you know, the idea here is the cell phone is great. It's an initial kind of entree into what we consider to be uh, a foundational element for wayfinding and could be used by really everyone who enters the UN. Uh, I mean, they could be given a UN branded lanyard and they could use these approaches uh, to navigate more seamlessly through in the public facing areas. Uh, so they have a better experience, right? But if someone is moderately or severely visually impaired, uh, speaking to what Chen mentioned about the 360 degree view, we have these wearable systems that have a, a much broader field of view. Not all of them are omnidirectional and that they're full 360, but a lot of them are closer to 180 or 270, depending on how many camera systems we have, right? And um, we've talked about potentially uh, being identified ahead of time and actually to have a wearable available um, for those who are interested. So they could just pop on a backpack and then have VPR available. The idea here is if this map is already set up and you know vpr uh you know the approach is downloaded on the embedded system in this unit we can maintain these systems or these platforms and then they could have a really dynamite experience where the accuracy improves the orientation information improves as well um and really it's a matter of uh, the sensors and the field of view on the on the on the platform itself so even though we're thinking of this as kind of a low-tech solution we're, we are um being mindful of, of of you know a higher tech um option as well
So um, unless there's uh, any more questions, I'll ask one more quick one. Uh, so a question for our students who might be interested in applying AI-based image recognition to increase uh, urban access or improve mobility. What's on the cutting edge of this cutting edge? What do you want to see more of our student researchers tackle? Good question. I could start off, you know, I mean, I think what's exciting about this is, you know, what this paper showed is, you know, that, um, you know, side view may be uh, somewhat weaker uh, based on front view for cars. But, you know, as, as uh, Chen mentioned, um, you know, a lot of this has to do with the speed and the sampling rate, right? So it'd be interesting to look at differences and to quantitatively explore what happens for pedestrians. And, you know, we're talking about this primarily for soft mobility, but as micro mobility is all the rage and, you know, uh, what else could be done in terms of pre-mapping, you know, where is that, um, you know, that kind of spectrum and how does it exist in shades of gray in between? So you're traveling at different speeds at what sampling rates and, you know, let's try and figure this out with at what point, you know, is side view more important where I'm directly orthogonal to storefronts or should I use an oblique angle or should we do more of a front view? And then, you know, what happens if I have a full 360? And so I think if we quantitatively explore some of these opportunities based on speed, you know, given the fact that we have bicycles, you know, running around at different speeds, we have e-scooters now running around at different speeds and velocities, and all of them are using a lot of them different sensor fusion techniques. I mean, I've been, um, you know, uh, I've, I've been the recipient of many, you know, the receiver of many emails um, about some of these new um, micro mobility companies um, and how to put, you know, their best disability foot forward. So Anyway, um, I, I think that would be uh, really on the uh, avant-garde, but I'll turn it over to Chen. Yeah, thanks, JR, for uh, talking about from the, the, uh, the navigation perspective. Maybe I can talk a little bit more about more high level. Um, I think in terms of uh, adding AI to the research of general transportation, uh, at least I, I am interested in two directions. One is the there's a lot of sensor data from either the fixed uh, sensors uh, that uh, I think all the transportation experts uh, are, have studied over the past uh, uh, many years, and including now uh, more frequently the sensor data that collected from uh, mobile robots, uh, self-driving cars. Um, how can we use those sensor data to analyze the uh, understand the transportation uh, uh, status in a, in a big uh, metropolitan area, right? This requires the um, our our students to um, to study AI's methods so that you can handle this large amount of data that is also mobile, is not fixed in a, in a single location. Uh, so you may need to study more into computer vision, right? Welcome to take my my course, robot perception. <laughs> I offer that every fall. Um, and also you, um, another, another direction I, I think would be interesting is, uh, especially for transportation system, um, is uh, the new area of graph neural network where the transportation system is naturally modeled as a graph um, and a network. How can you um, uh, benefit from the deep neural network uh, to process and, and um, um, uh, collect information, extract information from this kind of graphical data. I think these two directions are uh, exci especially uh, uh, exciting for me, and I would be more than happy. Actually, we already collaborated with uh, with uh, Kang and one of the Situ Smart PhD students and published a paper about the um, a special type of uh, graph neural networks. Um, yeah, so that's my opinion. Sure. Thank you both uh, so much, both for the answers to your questions and for talking about this extremely interesting interdisciplinary um, approach taking uh, to, to smart cities. Special, we're super excited to, to have more researchers work on the equity and access aspects of this. Um, so everyone, I, I just want to, a quick ending note, uh, like Professor Rizzo mentioned earlier, I just want to acknowledge funding and support by USDOT. If you enjoyed this webinar, uh, definitely follow the CQ Smart Center on Twitter, join our LinkedIn group, our mailing list, and hope to see you soon. Professor uh, Rizzo and Professor Feng, thanks a lot. We'll watch out for updates in the future. Thanks, everyone. Stay safe. Thank you, everyone. Thank okay. you.